I have sat staring at my computer screen reading articles upon articles about the Oklahoma reign of terror, the subject of the book bearing the same name as this movie we're talking about today. And yet 50 open tabs later, it's still hard for me to believe that this important part of the history of America, the genocide of its indigenous people has been so well hidden, kept out of popular culture for the most part. <laughs> Hey all, my name is Sucharita. Welcome back to my channel where I talk about movies and occasionally chat with people who make them. Today, we are discussing Martin Scorsese's highly anticipated epic drama, Killers of the Flower Moon. If you've managed to stay away from all trailers, clips, promotional materials and you want no spoilers, perhaps come back to this review after you've watched the film. I ain't got nothing but regret. The movie begins with a burial scene. A group of devastated Osage people sit in a circle as an elder says a prayer. It takes a moment to realize that what's being buried isn't a human, but a pipe. It takes another beat to understand why the pipe is being buried. It's because the Osage people have recently been forced by American lawmakers to move from Kansas to what is present-day Oklahoma. However, on screen, this lament soon turns to unbridled joy as the first oil reserve is discovered on this newly appointed land, making the Osage people instantly very wealthy. Also meaning the white man is coming. When this money started coming, we should have known it came with something else, a man observes later. Sure enough, soon the town of Fairfax begins to see an influx of white Americans, some looking to work for the wealthy Osage people, while others have more nefarious motives. Capitalism rears its ugly head, and the very wealth that has favored the Osage puts a target on their backs. This wealth should come to us. This film is seemingly so personal to Scorsese, this time he isn't just happy with making a cameo like he usually does, he actually bookends the film, appearing twice. The second one we'll talk about later, but in the beginning, he comes and he addresses the viewers directly, thanking us for choosing this theatre to watch his movie. This here is an 80-year-old man who hasn't just made films for 56 years, but he's continually changed the way multiple generations interact with cinema. If he's coming on with his hands folded, the subject may just be that much more special. So you settle in and hope for the best, your expectations now a little higher than they were five minutes ago. As a foreigner, mostly unaware of the history of the Osage people, I was worried I may not be able to follow and accurately contextualize the events of the movie. Since I've watched the film, I've spoken about it with a few people and when I tell you, so many people have little to no idea or interest in these tales. This perhaps was a challenge Scorsese and the legendary screenplay writer Eric Roth saw when adapting David Grant's book, Killers of the Flower Moon. The years of research that went into the book could have resulted in a standard one and a half two-hour movie set within a small period of time in this tale. Instead, over nearly three and a half hours, Scorsese very slowly and approachably goes from the discovery of the oil till the convictions many years later when the world found out the extent to which some men had gone to steal the riches of the Osage. You know, you got, you got nice color scheme. What color would you say that is? My color. While I'm glad the movie was this long, it allowed me enough time to absorb each scene before moving on to the next inciting incident. I did wonder why more of this time wasn't devoted to Lily Gladstone, who plays Molly Burkhart, the Osage woman Leonardo DiCaprio's character Ernest Burkhart marries in hopes of stealing her family money, guided by his evil uncle Bill King Hale, played by Robert De Niro. When you meet Molly, the world around her is rapidly evolving. The roads still are not paved, but horse carriages are giving way to motor cars. Her community is thriving, jewels, servants, homes, they have it all. And as such, Molly is wise to the advances of Ernest, even telling her sisters that she knows this coyote is after her money. But she's attracted to him because he wants to settle down. Her mother, the family matriarch Lizzie, chastises her later for marrying a white man. So this very wise, smart woman of a few words, Molly, gets swindled by two evil men. But the film doesn't allow her to explain how or justify it. Perhaps she has allowed herself to be indoctrinated into believing that she in fact is incompetent, a word she's forced to use for herself in order to access her own money. As according to the federal laws of the time, Osage people needed to have white guardians controlling their wealth for fear of misuse. I don't even need to say that this position of power was the one that was eventually misused. We don't keep Molly company when she's living her Osage life. In a haunting scene, an elder in her family dies and right before they pass, mystical apparitions walk the elder into her afterlife. What we see on screen, Molly's acknowledgement of her culture, is probably just one moment when she refuses to shut a window during rainfall, choosing instead to stay silent in respect of the storm. In a voiceover later, you'll hear her talk about the rage in her heart against the men killing her people and looting her land. But the screenplay, not being from her point of view, doesn't give her enough room to express or act upon these feelings. Money flows freely here now. 
I do love that money, sir. <laughs> Killers of the Flower Moon chooses to spend most time with its biggest movie star, Leonardo DiCaprio. Ernest is a World War I veteran with a weakness for women and money. His uncle uses these two traits to orchestrate this big plan of stealing Osage money, lacking the foresight to even imagine that the snake might eventually bite its own tail. Ernest, despite his name, is not a sincere person at all. He's of a simplistic bent of mind and it's almost too easy for master manipulator Bill Hale to get Ernest to do the dirty work. Through Ernest and Hale's relationship, the film shows you how easy the federal government had made it for these white men to do as they pleased. Even a simpleton like Ernest could execute and get away with large-scale theft legally. Both actors are beyond terrific in their roles, while De Niro as Hale doesn't get a whole lot of depth beyond evil man up to no good. I mean, there is one mention about about him being a 32nd degree mason in a bizarre but interesting punishment scene, it's Ernest whose character changes colour with each passing sequence. Leonardo DiCaprio goes from his trademark boyish charm to contorting his face into various monstrous expressions over and over. It almost reads like our current relationship with ongoing travesties in the world, the casteism, sexism, queer phobia we see around us and we choose to ignore, doing just enough to not feel guilty about our lack of participation in revolutions. Are we all now just idiots being puppeteered by smart and wicked people into doing their bidding while being not just useless but actively harmful to the causes we claim so much to care about? This is going to be another tragedy. The film wants its audience to feel this guilt. The long runtime makes sure of it. Master editor Thelma Schoonmaker, cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto, and composer Robbie Robertson ensure your attention doesn't waver. At one point, Hale says to Ernest, this is going to be another common tragedy tomorrow. People will forget because people don't care. Seeing where we are in the world right now with Islamophobia, wars, genocides unfolding in multiple communities and countries. Are we not complicit in looking the other way? Are we not these people too? Aren't we earnest? When Jesse Plamons shows up as a Washington DC appointed officer investigating the Osage murders, you almost breathe a sigh of relief that now the bad things will stop. Someone else is here to take care of it. I can just go back to now just watching. I'm, I'm supportive, but I'm a spectator. Perhaps to drive this emotion home, the movie chooses to follow Ernest rather than Molly. Ernest is so much more easily manipulated and we can see ourselves reflected in him, perhaps. Lest you forget, all these people on your screen, nearly every last one was a real person doing the things that you're seeing. Scorsese again pulls you up for treating stories like this as just true crime. He shows you a radio show recording in the end. An announcer categorizes the what you just saw as true crime. Scorsese then shows up again, reading from a piece of paper, an obituary that highlights what happened of the court cases against Hale and the like or what didn't happen. This movie is straight up a cinematic masterpiece, one of Scorsese's best, most moving work. Don't let the duration or the lack of familiarity with the story deter you from watching it this weekend at a movie theater. Expecting a miracle to make all this go away? You know they don't happen anymore. So on a scale of one to 10, Killers of the Flower Moon is 1918 to 1931. This reign of terror went on. Even if you're waiting to watch the film on Apple TV, I think it's going to drop soon. At least one time Wikipedia, but you should read about it. As always, here is a reminder that subscribe to the channel before you switch to another video suggested by YouTube about Killers of the Flower Moon to keep you glued to this app because that's how everyone is making money. You click on that subscribe button. My name is Acharita. Thank you for stopping by. Number one.